concerning a natural environment. Um, I think this is our sixth meeting since we were created back in uh, the summer of 2019. And of course, we had virtually no meetings during 2020 because of the COVID problem. Um, but I'm hoping that during the rest of this year, we can make some rapid progress to cover a number of important issues as we go forward, um, as we can see later from the work plan. Um, Emily, should we start with the roll call, please? Certainly, thank you. Um, could I start with panel members, please? Councillor Peter Jones? I'm here, yes. Councillor Bridget Rowlands? Present, Emily. Councillor Linda Tyler Lloyd? Councillor Mary Jones? Present. Councillor Mary Sherwood? Yes, present. Councillor Wendy Fitzgerald? Yes, I'm here. Councillor Will Thomas and the invited officers and cabinet members today, Councillor Andrea Lewis. Present. Councillor Louise Gibbard. Uh, yeah, present, thanks. Martin Nichols. Present. Rachel Lewis. Present. Susie Richards. Present. And Deb Hill is, is to join us shortly, thank you. Are there any other members or officers I've not called today? Thank you. And we've received apologies from Councillor Steve Gallagher, Irene Mann, Christine Richards and Hazel Morris. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Emily. Um, let's uh, crack on. Members might also wish to note that Phil McDonnell um, is observing the meeting, uh, although not permitted either to or to take any part in the proceedings as such. Um, but he'll certainly be listening. Um, obviously, he has an interest in what this panel gets up to. Um, OK, item two, disclosure of personal and prejudicial interests. Uh, forever hold your peace if uh, it's not the case. OK, thank you. Three, prohibition of whipped votes and de declaration of party whips. I guess this is a formality that we recognise and follow. And that then brings us on to item four, which is the uh, the minutes of the, the last meeting, which was held on the 22nd of March uh, 2021. Uh, first of all, if we just go quickly for accuracy, please. Page one, page two, page three, you can find it, page four. Um, are there any comments, first of all, on the accuracy of those minutes? Are we content that they can be signed as a, a correct record? All happy? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, in terms of matters arising, um, just going through very quickly on page two, um, we've now, I believe, members have received a copy from uh, Nature Conservation section of the Section Six Biodiversity Duty Monitoring Report, um, which we may want to come back to not today, but at a later meeting, possibly. Um, we've also received. Now, a copy of the Biodiversity SPG uh, adopted by a planning committee uh, back in February. <coughs> and then the good news um, at the bottom of page two, the penultimate bullet point to report that both a new Section 6 Biodiversity Officer and a new Planning Ecologist, both of those posts have now been filled on a, pass on a part time basis. And I, I'm assured that they will be taking up their posts very shortly. And that's very good news, of course, for the nature conservation theme, as it will enable them to expand uh, their activity, take pressure off the existing staff, um, and particularly in relation to the Section 6 responsibility under the Environment Act. Uh, there's now a specific officer in place to enable the Council to meet that legal requirement, and that's great news. Um, over the page on page three, um, New tree initiatives, a reference to a guidance note on planting right tree in the right place. Nice title that, right tree in the right place. I gather from talking to Deb Hill that report is in, pre in, uh, in preparation uh, and will be submitted to members once we have it. Um, and then I think that's probably all that there is to report with reference to those minutes. I would note 
efforts to reduce mowing in parks and verges. Uh, I and others have had some discussion with uh, Councillor Mark Thomas, uh, public concerns in particular about Singleton Park and what members of the public there have expressed concern about what they saw as excessive mowing. Um, but that's an ongoing issue that we'll deal with obviously in another place and in another way. Uh, any any other points that the members want to raise on the minutes? No? OK. Moving on then, uh, number five, public questions, Emily? No public questions for today, no. OK, thank you very much. Which then brings us on to item six, which of course is the main business of today's meeting, uh, Climate Emergency Declaration Council Action Plan Progress. And we've received, of course, uh, a very lengthy and helpful report uh, that I understand Martin Nichols is the author of. Um, can I just say that uh, last night in thinking about climate change, it occurred to me, or rather global carbon emissions, I've been around on this planet for about 70 years or so, heaven help me. Um, in that time, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, atmosphere or carbon equivalence, CO2 equivalence, has grown by something like 45 to 50 percent uh, compared with the pre-industrial level. That's frightening. That's in my lifetime. In my lifetime, there's been an increase approaching 50 percent in the level of CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. And I think that's something we need to note. And I thought forward on that. If we go to 2030, against our present level of 418 part from parts per million CO2 equivalents, It'll be somewhere between 435 or 440 uh, at present rates. And going forward to, for, uh, to 2050, if we do nothing, it will have risen further to something like 475, 480 parts per million. That's worth bearing in mind. That's the seriousness and the severity of the task that we face if we fail to respond actively in terms of curbing carbon emissions and finding alternatives, therefore to fossil fuel based activities and the like. So I won't carry on with that and I could, but I won't. Um, who's going to introduce? Is it going to be you, Martin, or will it be you, Andrea? If I could just say a few words, uh, Chair, oh, thank oh. you. Um, I, I will be brief because as you've as you've rightly said, it's quite a lengthy report. Um, you know, there's clearly a lot going on and a lot to report on. So I will be handing over to Martin to take us through that. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to the panel for the invitation and the opportunity, because this is a critical uh, area of work for us as a local authority, and we really do appreciate the opportunity to, to show the panel the work that's going on. But I think it's also important that we recognise the work that has happened previously and prior to our declaration uh, with the climate emergency. We've been on this journey, um, not by accident, by, by intent, for quite some time. And we've had a carbon reduction strategy in place, for example, since 2009, 2010. Uh, and so the work of the, the climate plan builds upon some excellent work that the local authority has been doing. And, and it was surprising, actually, when you look at the level of detail, what an impact and influence we as a council can make. Um, because it, it, you know, people would be forgiven for thinking, well, the council can't make a difference, but I think the panel will find uh, going through the reports that actually we are very influential and we can make a massive difference in our part of the world. And if others did the same, then collectively that could make a huge difference to tackling climate change. I just wanted to, um, also to pay recognition and add my thanks in advance to Martin, who has been essential as a lead on climate change. Uh, but also to Rachel and Susie that have made some major contributions to this agenda. Uh, and I, I very much appreciate it. And, and with that, Chair, I'm going to finish there because the, the report is critically important, a lot to get through, and I'm anxious for the panel to hear more details. So thank you for the introduction uh, and over to Martin. Thank you, Andrea. Martin, off you go. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank, thanks, uh, Andrea, for that introduction. Uh, I'll just um, make sure I can get it up here. Give me a minute. OK. 
Okay. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, apologies in advance. It, it is quite a lengthy presentation, but um, th there was a, uh, a desire not to leave anything out. So what we've done is include all the information, but I, I will obviously not go through every detail on every slide, but quite happy to take then questions on anything that I do skim over just because uh, obviously the time that we've got available for the panel. Do you, want, so, Martin, do you want to take questions slide by slide or wait until you finish the... Is it the possible, page? Chair, to take them when they finish, only because I won't be able to see hands go up and I'll, I'll probably end okay. up talking over people. Yeah. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, in terms of, uh, as has been uh, mentioned, you know, the, the, the recent actions that the Council have taken, I'll go back over some of the historic actions as well. It has been on this journey for many, many years. Uh, more notably and recently, the climate emergency declared in June 2019 uh, and then the uh, report and policy that was approved by Council back in December 2020. Uh, and I would like to pay tribute as well as to the officers that uh, Councillor Lewis has mentioned and, and her and uh, Louise Gibbard as well for their support. This is a cross council approach. This isn't any one individual. This is by drawing together resources from across all of the council, uh, past and present and no doubt future to ensure that there are, we maximise the opportunities and the cohesion across the whole council. So um, some of the uh, key, key facts and figures, I guess, in terms of our ambition to drive towards 2030 net zero, uh, and some of these are, may have, uh, you may be already aware of, and uh, Council Lewis has mentioned, obviously, some of the historic uh, actions the council has taken. 2019-2020 um, was when the first uh, carbon reduction plan was developed by the council. So it seems an awful long time ago, and I do remember writing it. So, uh, But a 55% reduction in the council's direct emissions from what it was measuring back in 2009-2010. Now, now, given the growth of the council services over that period, that, that uh, my view, is, is no mean feat. Um, the second item, which is around uh, not directly, um, you know, developed by the council, but obviously the council's pension fund management, uh, which the council has influence over, a, a commitment and a reduction in fossil fuel investment by 50% over the four years. The council is now uh, rolling out its uh, suite of electric vehicle charge points. More <laughs> are due to be done now over this coming year. Uh, so that's set out there as well, which we know we are. Uh, as a council and as a region need to improve the network of electric charge points to be able to promote that as a uh, suitable way of uh, people being able to uh, purchase and maintain their electric vehicles. <coughs> the council has for many, many years, certainly 10 years plus, purchased its uh, electricity from renewable sources and the current contract that's currently being relet will maintain that but it is also exploring the opportunity of purchasing its gas from renewable sources as well. And that's something that we'll be looking to report to Cabinet shortly. 580 kilowatts of, of community solar energy panels benefiting our schools and a community through a combination of skis and a combination of the current programmes that are ongoing currently with our schools. Uh, I'm sure members will be fully aware about the Council's commitment in terms of its new homes development programme and the development of its Swansea standard which integrates uh, solar battery storage and air source heat pumps. And that is becoming the standard and will be our standard for developing all of our new council homes in the future. And we would very much be looking to try and drive that through all homes that are developed within Swansea in the years to come. A significant growth in our active travel network. And again, that's well supported by Welsh Government. Um, it appears that that is going to continue through the new Welsh Government administration. We're trying to finalise the details of the, this year's programme and in the, the next two to three years. Uh, the current vehicle fleet, we believe it's the largest EV fleet in Wales. The numbers are growing. Uh, when this slide was done, it was 40. With the current procurement process just being completed, it's going to rise to 51. And we are currently evaluating tenders to identify further opportunities for both EV and other um, uh, le le more environmentally friendly vehicles than, than the diesel vehicles we operate. And that's something that's going to be evaluated on the tender analysis over the next uh, few weeks. One of the challenges there, which will probably come up later on as well, is the ability, given that the council has a fleet of circa 700 plus vehicles, is the ability for it to uh, green the heavy goods vehicles uh, there are there is a growing market and an effective market for vans and small cars. 
that market doesn't exist yet commercially in terms of HGV fleet and other heavy goods vehicles. Um, and that's something the council is looking at and investigating hydrogen as an option, but also discussing with other developers to what is coming to the market over the years to come. And that will absolutely be necessary for us to achieve our emissions targets that we're setting out. Uh, Eco schools, the council and its education department are signing up and very good engagement from our young people, which is absolutely fundamental for our future generations aspirations. Uh, our waste recycling targets have been a bit of a challenge over the last 12 months given uh, COVID and a lot of people are at home and recycling levels are have been a, a bit of a struggle. We do expect to be able to achieve the target for this year, but hitting 64% for the last full year that's been published. And 21,000 streetlights have been upgraded to low emissions and LEDs uh, over the life of this project from 2009-2010. Uh, and there are proposals to further reduce the emissions from our street lighting network. And we will continue to champion and explore large scale renewable projects such as Dragon Energy Island. So effectively, what, what are our objectives? Well, as a, as a council, and this will, has been hopefully clearly articulated within the report that was approved back in December, we will be achieving by 2030 net carbon zero for our uh, in scope emissions so our scope one and scope two emissions as a council and those are the things that the council can directly influence because it's the it's the heating in our buildings it's the cars that we drive um etc so it, it is the way in which the council can definitely lead by example and how will we do that well it is this council integrated approach and it has to be a whole council it is about setting up robust uh, action plans and developing uh, targets against the in-scope emissions and it is about looking at our policy context and our policy areas and identifying where necessary that we update or provide new policies to be able to drive that change that is required. We, we've tried uh, and it's took a little bit of, of, of getting to but we tried to, to set out in as if it was at all possible a, a single picture as to what the council is going to try to do to achieve that net zero by 2030 uh, and I, I won't go through every one of them but you'll see within the, the center of the circle our ambition of net zero by 2030 and then the range of policy areas and the range of activities that are circling that from our energy strategy our green inf infrastructure strategy you'll be aware of the local biodiversity plan the, the LDP and the supplementary planning guidance that goes with that a review of our procurement strategy and maximising the opportunity for environmental benefits and social value and work continues in that regard. Our sustainable transport strategy, which is probably the only one where we don't yet have a fully joined up coherent strategy and that's currently being developed through uh, the policy development committee and that will encompass our, our green fleet, our grey fleet, um, the street lighting and also lead into that wider, wider county-wide sustainable travel solution that we need to both achieve our 2030 target and the wider council target for 2050. We have an existing waste management strategy but we are reviewing that currently as part of this plan and it aligns with the fact that Welsh Government are reviewing their all Wales strategy and that isn't going to be just about recycling targets it's also looking wider than that in terms of perhaps single-use plastics perhaps what the council can do in terms of where it buys uh, its products from etc looking at the opportunity to include more rigorous targets in for example new build projects with the percentage of recyclable materials that could be used uh, and finally and last but not least the, the housing strategy which links into for example both the new builds that i mentioned earlier and our Swansea standard but also the wider decarbonization strategy of our housing stock and then using that as a lever to look to decarbonize the wider stock within the city and county of Swansea and that overarching then is is under our banner of the climate change strategy and hopefully and it does uh, align then to both the current corporate plan and the future corporate plans that will be developed certainly the one for next year uh, when when it's renewed we are looking to embed a greater proportion of that in terms of some of these key aspirations that we've set out uh, the sustainable development policy and of course then overarching that the well-being of future generations act uh, one of the things that we we were asked to look at and, and we've been trying to set out is okay well we've We've got we've got a good plan. We think we've got some good actions. How, how do we measure it? And how do we demonstrate demonstrate success? 
and, and I, you know we tried not to get overly hung up uh, in terms of trying to measure absolutely everything. What's important is doing the right things and then trying to report on progress. Uh, too often I've seen examples where you know you get consumed by measurement uh, methodology and actually that just stymies the opportunity to get on and, and, and do stuff. So these are the key ones that have been developed this year and the idea is to pilot these during the course of the year and then look to build these into the corporate priorities as I said in the new corporate plan redraft from 22-23 onwards. So uh, I'll run through them briefly. So energy, uh, we are looking at a target of a year-on-year -year reduction of at least 3% on our energy consumed within our, our building stock. That's across all buildings, including schools and public buildings and social services premises. The second, uh, which is around our sustainable transport uh, and the green fleet strategy, we, we are looking at ambitious targets of a 5% year-on-year reduction in both green fleet acquisitions and reductions in emissions. And that will be a challenge for the reasons I mentioned earlier, just because of the technology implications. There, there may well be a cost implication as well. And of course, that's for Cabinet to, to, to determine when each of those tendering rounds take place. Uh, and the first of those, as I said, is currently uh, being evaluated and we will shortly be uh, awarding those contracts in the next few weeks. Uh, the third aspect, which um, we, we, we aren't really obliged to include, but we really feel we need to, which is around the grey fleet. So that is individual employees working for the council, driving their own vehicles um, on council business. And the reason why it, it's important that that is included is you, you could achieve your reduction in emissions um, by, for example, taking a load of people out of council vehicles and getting them to drive their own cars. Technically, it reduces your emissions, but quite clearly, it makes no difference in terms of the overall impact on the environment. And in fact, may well have a negative impact if the council's fleet is newer and more energy efficient than people's own personal vehicles. The likelihood is by driving people into using their own uh, modes of transport, um, then, then effectively you, you may be making things worse, not better. So we are looking at those targets on grey fleet. To give you an indication, and I appreciate it's uh, been a rather unique year over the last 12 months, but the reductions in emissions from the uh, grey fleet, from people effectively driving their own car and claiming mileage, has been over 50%, over half a million miles reduced transport because people are working more agile and working from home. Now, appreciate that isn't uh, what we perhaps at class as no a normal year, but it does demonstrate that circumstances can change the behaviours that we operate and therefore lead to some significant reductions. And what we need to try and do is embed those going forward. Uh, sustainable trans uh, transport again under the, the street lighting. We have achieved a, a an over over a 66 percent reduction in the street lighting emissions over the last 10 years. And therefore you are getting now down to marginal changes at the current rate of progress with the current investment we're achieving. Uh, circa 1% reduction year on year. So we're effectively doubling that over the next 10 years to make a, a total of a 20% reduction. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, as part of a report that's going to Cabinet tomorrow in relation to the recovery plan, uh, Cabinet are being asked to approve an additional investment in street lighting, um, which will, will allow us to get to that 2% for this year. And we'd hope that that sort of investment will continue in the years to come. And then finally, looking at that investment in offsetting measures and generation, uh, we're already looking at the, the Council's first renewable uh, PV solar farm. I've mentioned Dragon Energy Island, but clearly to be able to get to our ambitions of net zero, as well as making reductions in emissions, we do have to find suitable offsetting measures. So to get to that net, net, net 2030 uh, target, it, it is about collaboration, it is about working with others, and it is definitely about leading by example and the council demonstrating that it's prepared to pull its own weight in this regard. However, to do that, we know that as we move from the 2030 to the 2050 target, it is crucial that the council then has to uh, involve residents and businesses and stakeholders and partners in terms of developing the overall longer term 2050 strategy. 
So the 2030 strategy is for the council emissions. The 2050 is an ambition that the whole of the city and county of Swansea will achieve net zero by that date. And that aligns to the Welsh government's requirements as well. This slide hopefully tries to set out that, that therefore the 2030 targets of the council are, are effectively a step change towards the overall ambition. And it is about, as I've said, working with partners and businesses and government uh, and making sure that we get communities involved in the journey and the direction of travel to achieve those overall ambitions. Um, the next slide is, is a, um, effectively sets up the same thing. So, so how do we do this? Well, one of the ways that we've uh, suggested, which has been endorsed by Cabinet and Council, is for, for the Council to effectively launch a pledge scheme, lo launch a carbon commitment where individuals and organisations can effectively sign up and pledge to making a difference and making that publicly uh, visible, making sure people can see that and try and create that critical mass of individuals and organisations who are prepared to become advocates and drive this agenda forward. It, it's clearly a, a long term strategy. This isn't something that's going to happen overnight, although I, I'm sure everybody will agree that many of the actions that need to be taken need to be taken urgently, but it will take some time for some of those actions to embed over the longer term. Uh, what we can't do is wait to somewhere near 2050 before doing anything. I, I don't think that's uh, uh, that's debated by anybody. So we need to set set the uh, the agenda. We need to have that dialogue over the medium to longer term. We need that Team Swansea approach and we must be able to empower and enable action to be done. So the, ne the next section, which uh, I think we've probably mentioned previously, that the Council was looking as part of this engagement strategy to uh, run its climate change survey. Hopefully most of you, if not all of you, will have seen it and will have also uh, have participated in it. Um, and this is a summary and then some of the slides following show some of the key findings and actions. So the reality is we've had over a thousand responses, which from my recollection in my time in local government is probably the highest number of responses that we've ever had in any public consultation, uh, which, which is uh, absolutely staggering. And, and my thanks to Rachel and Susie for for devising the, the survey, having the patience to see it through, uh, amending it when we were receiving some initial feedback in the early days to actually refine it, to make it um, uh, effectively easier to fill in and pe giving people the options that they needed or, or felt they needed to be able to submit a meaningful response. So a huge number of responses, also backed up by a Twitter poll that we, we talked about. Um, th there are some gaps, um, you know, we would look because of the COVID restrictions, we haven't been able to do any face-to-face -face yet, but that is planned as part of the engagement strategy. We want to have more targeted engagement with children in schools, but given where schools were just returning back from the COVID restrictions, it, it didn't feel appropriate to put them under any further pressure than what we already have. But that is something we revisit. And we will also look to uh, undertake further engagement with businesses because, again, they were coming out of the pandemic and prob uh, many of them, most of them, were more concerned about being able to survive. Um, we did have some responses, but probably not as many as we would in normal circumstances. So we're going to look to, to push that forward. And it is about sort of using our networks and building on those relationships to get those maximum responses. So in terms of the, the, the response rate, uh, as we have mentioned, we've got responses from individuals, from elected representatives, from voluntary groups and communities, from public and private and third sector partners and uh, from across the council services and using all of those mechanisms, both the council and person people's private contacts um, to spread that message and again, create that critical mass of returns. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, that the responses were probably uh, not just in the order of what we were hoping for in terms of people's appreciation of climate change, but certainly from my point of view, uh, exceeded the expectations uh, in, in almost every question. So, you know, to have a position where, you know, over 93% of people are concerned about climate change uh, and 94% of people indicated in their responses they are prepared to make changes uh, is, is pretty staggering uh, and hopefully does demonstrate a real commitment to change. Uh, one of the important factors was a large amount of responses came from council staff. I think it was around about 350 responses came from council employees. And again, that's a very high number and demonstrates back to the earlier point that the council's ambitions to deliver this 
Uh, it bodes well if large numbers of staff are participating and are very positive about the need to make those changes. Um, and then we also uh, have a slide in there regarding the Twitter poll and the attitudes, which weren't quite as uh, overwhelmingly positive, uh, and we haven't quite uh, unravelled as to why perhaps uh, the, the sort of level of very concerned isn't quite as high with the Twitter response as it was with the survey. Um, but none, nonetheless, you know, it does again reinforce the fact that we have an overwhelming positive response to the actions that are being taken. And again, appetite for change, uh, significant number, 78%, slightly lower, but still, you know, well, well above your 50-50 your, uh, your in terms of the appetite for change coming through that survey as well. Uh, one of the questions which was around the impact of lockdown, and as you can see on the slide there, um, you know, clearly lots of people um, are, are, have made behaviour changes, uh, which partly forced on them as a result of lockdown. Certainly, you know, doing less journeys in, in cars, some people selling their cars and choosing working from home. And I think what's important is we try and embed the positive benefits from the restrictions that followed on from COVID and use them to drive forward some of the changes that we need to have in terms of climate change. Um, one of the questions which was around uh, what would help you make changes for a net zero Swansea? Um, and again, there's a summary there of, of the key responses to that. Some people have talked about funding and we are looking particularly in relation to uh, whether we can help businesses uh, and look uh, access grants for, uh, for that. Um, I know there's quite a lot of uh, homeowners who would certainly want to uh, access funding to make improvements on their homes. And I'm, I'm not sure the government grant schemes previously have really offered what uh, householders are looking for because the take up on that has been on things like Green Deal has been quite poor over the years. Um, interestingly, information, 32 percent of people uh, felt they needed more information to allow them to make the change, which does help us inform the way in which we go forward with future consultation and engagement. Uh, again, advice, you know, similar similar theme, peer support and other. So so it's useful to have some clear um, uh, identifiable actions that individuals and organizations are saying to the council. Now, I'm, I'm not intending to go through every one of these. The, these are there so that you can see the overall responses on each of the questions. Um, what I will just do is highlight the ones where perhaps then then they're not almost at 100 percent just to uh, uh, identify some of the actions we might take. So whilst everybody is committed to making a change, um, there, there is a, a little bit of a blip there in terms of, well, you know, not as many agree, for example, of reducing uh, staff travel using their own cars and promoting tr public transport. So whilst the staff responses are indicating we're fully supportive and we agree with it, there is a little bit that comes out that says, however, if it affects me in the way I do my job, I might like to continue to drive my car. So I think there's a, a behaviour change and that's one of the policy discussions that we do need to have in terms of uh, um, in terms of, you know, taking that forward with staff. But we do have to be mindful the council still has to deliver its services as well. So so that's one that jumps out as we need a little bit of uh, consideration on. Uh, and Dragon and Energy Island, uh, some people may well have associated that with if we would have said Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, they may have uh, picked up on that. But again, there's a bit more communications to be done on that. Um, in terms of the council's actions, slightly lower uh, overall, strongly agree. But as you can see, the, the strongly agree and tend to agree are still, you know, well up in the 70, 80 percent and, and above. And these relate to some of the actions that are currently within our plan. And what we were trying to do is make sure that they still are the key actions that we need to take. Um, so it is about re replacing council vehicles with green fleet. Um, it is, again, the same sort of trend on that second question around, um, you know, use of own cars, promoting public transport use. And I suspect there may be some concerns from employees there around, um, well, OK, I, I'm happy to try and not use my car as much, but if I've got to get to uh, my clients or whatever it may be, is that practical on public transport? And I think there's there's options there that we need to explore and consider. Um, again, pretty good, pretty good and high results in terms of the remaining measures around council building emissions building all future buildings and schools to net zero standards, uh, which I'm pleased to say is being supported by Welsh Government by additional funding as well. And again, looking at emissions from street lighting also being reduced. Um, some of the other actions around 
yes, support for investing in solar panels and battery storage, creating solar farms, certainly high support for increasing tree cover and biodiversity. Uh, and that's one of the measures in terms of offsetting the worst. We know we wish to do it and we know we will do it. And I think uh, Chair mentioned earlier that we are currently developing a council tree policy that would allow us to identify all land opportunities where trees and reforestation could take place going forward and effectively have a map and a plan of our future tree planting strategy. And then we can bid for grant money and identify funding against a current plan, whereas at the moment it's a little bit ad hoc. So that's a key one. We're not quite sure how that's measured. And, and in our consultation, nobody seems to be able to give a clear measure as to you know, uh, what uh, carbon emissions can be offset against tree planting, because it just depends on age of tree, size of tree, species of tree, etc. The, the reality is, I don't think anybody disagrees that planting more trees is the right thing to do. So we won't we won't delay getting on with the strategy whilst we work out how we're going to count them. And I think that's really important in terms of one of the key aspects that we've learned through this process. Uh, some of the other key actions, um, agile working, a lot of feedback around, you know, people's uh, desire to work from home. Uh, again, reducing transport emissions. We obviously have to look there about the alternative that some people indicating, well, I'm working from home, which is great. I'm not using my car, but I'm actually using my, my, my heating more than I might have done. And therefore, is that more uh, effective or, or worse for the environment than if we were all in one single building? And that, that's something we've got to, I'm sure lots of organisations are wrestling with that. Again, the education and the behaviour change comes out strongly. Uh, alternative energy, you know, are we exploring that? Yes, we are, but it's good to get that reinforced. Uh, some some questions around procurement around, you know, is the council promote, you know, should the council be looking to do more uh, to discourage uh, consumption of meat, particularly in schools? And that's a question that uh, is being picked up by our education department, single use plastics, local sourcing. And I think the procurement strategy is quite important with that because this social value aspect very much aligns and the change in government legislation will allow us to look at valuing local sourcing more highly and legally than we currently do and the water management are maximizing the, uh, the the use of gray water and and reducing the the, the use of blue water uh, in terms of sorry i've lost the top of the slide so um but again just just a, a, another theme in terms of you know uh, the key aspects around energy green infrastructure biodiversity natural resources all of the questions pretty much tell a consistent pattern that you know up to 90 percent of people and above uh, agree strongly or tend to agree with the 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 activities the council's undertaken and this this sets out as you remember that that, that flower diagram earlier on these are the key strands of the council strategy which again it's good to get endorsement that that our plan has the support of people who responded to the consultation um we mentioned the pension fund earlier. Some of the responses came back again around we would like you to disinvest from fossil fuels in your pension. And we know that's something that's being looked at. Uh, looking at incentives for green activity. Again, we've mentioned that particularly we're looking at targeting businesses and third sector organisation and having conversations with the, the Swansea Environment Forum to look as to how we can maximise those opportunities. Um, one of the things that did come out, which I don't think we'd, we'd picked up directly, which was around inequalities and fuel poverty and food poverty. And, and, you know, many people will want to make the change, but their finances prevent them from doing so. And actually, in a way, uh, particularly fuel poverty, we, we know we know from our experience with uh, council housing that, you know, because of the way in which people uh, have to live, for example, with with, uh, you know, uh, with you know, paper meters, etc. cetera, they're, they're probably, it's probably costing them more in the way they're operating their heating. And actually it's probably more environmentally damaging as well. So I think there's a, we've got to look as to how through this plan, we try and address not just total emissions, but the inequalities on those emissions and look particularly in deprived areas as to how we manage to get those messages out and that, and that support out. Unsurprisingly, big support for looking for a good active travel solution and public transport and whilst some of that is out of direct council control it is clearly within the the um within the the scope of the 2050 target and the the new the discussions on a regional basis through city deal metro system we do certainly hope will uh, seek to address that 
and we've mentioned household energy for sufficient support. Uh, other common themes, education. Again, we've talked about that. That's something that we need to retarget because it, it was just a little bit difficult through the previous engagement, but that's part of the forward plan. Covered agile working and how we managed to deal with that and, and certainly the IT investment and infrastructure and obviously people's personal choices and home life balance as well. Uh, and recycling facilities, are there enough? Are they in the right place? Do they recycle everything that needs to be done? So again, that came through in the survey. Uh, and we must protect our green spaces. I know the council is committed to that and is going to enhance that. And we'll be opening the first public park, probably in many generations associated with the new uh, arena later on this year. So, you know, I think that's a real sign of commitment from the council as well. So what, what, what we took from these surveys, and we're still analysing the results, and my thanks to Susie, because it's a, a huge task going through a thousand plus responses. Um, people in Swansea are concerned about climate change. Um, people in Swansea support the council's proposed key actions. Uh, and actually, what the message coming back is, you need to go faster and you need to go further, which was really encouraging because some of the choices the council has to make are going to be difficult. And I think to get an endorsement, albeit through a sort of, you know, a, a random survey, at least seems to give us the indication that we're heading in the right direction. So next steps. Uh, Ongoing work with partners towards the 2050 target. We, we, we've concentrated initially on getting the SW getting Swansea Council to where it needed to be. And I think we're making really, really good progress and building on the, the many years of efforts that have been done, as Councillor Lewis mentioned earlier. We're using the survey feedback to inform the design and delivery of services, and that will link into the service planning approach next year. Uh, developing that you said we did approach so you asked us to do this and we are doing this as a result because one of the things I've learned from surveys and any public consultation if you fail to heed the, the points that people put back and don't act on them people will very quickly say well what's what's the point you've asked me a question I told you what you need to do and you've gone and ignored it so whether it's practical or not we need to make sure that we we demonstrate that we've acted where we can and if it's and if we're unable to act because it, we don't have the legislative powers then we need to be able to explain to people why that that's the case. And we're heading following this session and another session with wider cabinet. We're looking then to publish an updated report in the summer, and that report will also then set out those key performance indicators and the clear actions that arise out of that consultation. Um, apologies, sorry, it, it's a lot, and I've gone through it as, as quick as I could. It, it, it's very difficult to shortcut uh, this sort of stuff, so I hope that uh, the panel have. Um, Got, got value out of that and, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions and I'm sure those also in attendance so would be happy to do so. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very Thank you much very indeed, much. Martin. That's really been, really been a very, very impressive, impressive. Uh, uh, response. I'm getting, I'm an, getting an echo. What else? Oh. oh, it's gone now. That's good. Um, I would like to thank Martin again. Um, a very detailed, very comprehensive coverage of the issue and the practical steps involved uh, in relation to the local authorities' practical uh, abilities to respond. Um, just a couple of things before I open it up to a wider discussion. Um, plastics were mentioned, council use of plastics. I think that is something that this panel might want to have a look at uh, sometime as we go forward to see whether the ways to see what is the level of plastic use and whether there are ways in, in which this can be uh, reduced. And the other one, of course, is the uh, the government intention to legislate on peat use. And uh, again, the council's use of uh, peat products. In fact, I had a discussion with our, our parks people a couple of days ago, and I was very pleased to learn that they are not using peat based products uh, for planting uh, for uh, trees and so forth. So but that, we may want to look at that again. Anyway, OK, I, th I think I saw Wendy Fitzgerald first. Wendy. Sorry, Chair, I wasn't quite ready. Uh, <laughs> um, just uh, uh, picking up what you said on Pete, I believe it was on farming today. I, I, I heard that in mushroom growing, Pete is the one uh, product that is used you know if you're if you're producing mushrooms on a large scale you use peat and the question is what could be the substitute so that is just an aside chair for information 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Uh, uh, well, three questions really. Electric cars, um, yes, I, I, I go along with the fact that they are obviously very beneficial, but I'm just wondering, as we're pushing for more people to move to electric cars, what are we doing about batteries? Because there clearly is a problem about disposal of batteries at the end of their lives. They contain some very nasty ingredients and there clearly has to be a strategy for how we manage these in terms of the environment. And number two, yes, the um, the way uh, the council have built new houses, the energy efficiency, etc., the heat pumps, and everything else that has been installed. Um, the suggestion was that this these standards should be extended to all homes, and I don't dispute that at all. I'm just wondering uh, the financial viability of doing this. If, if private businesses have to incorporate all of these things, how is that going to affect the viability in terms of selling their houses? And finally, the survey that was carried out, I think it was said it was about a thousand responses, which I agree was very positive. But then it went on to say there were 350 plus from council staff who would be generally more informed. And that worried me slightly because surely it is Joe Public that we should be trying to engage, not just staff or, or a large proportion of council staff. Although, of course, I can understand that there are issues that the council need to address with its own staff. That's generally... The main questions I wanted to ask, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you, Wendy. Uh, who wants to respond? I've got hands up from Andrea and from Louise. Andrea. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and, and I'm sure Martin will want to come in as well. Um, just if I could just give uh, some sort of brief overviews, really. Um, I, and I understand Councillor Fitzgerald's uh, concerns about the, the future of batteries. There's been a lot of discussion around recycling car batteries so that they can be used as battery storage in homes, for example. So just because they've reached an end of life with a vehicle doesn't necessarily mean that they end up uh, on the um, scrap heap, as it were. Um, you know, there, there are ways that we can probably reutilize those. And there are some, you know, there's some innovations which are in the pipeline as well in terms of the materials that batteries are, are used, uh, are used in batteries, which are more environmentally friendly. So. This is um, a very innovative, progressive area, uh, and I think it would be wrong of us to judge vehicles in their current form with the batteries as they currently are, because things are moving, it's fair to say, at a, a pace and speed and are improving all the time. And that, that includes the capacity of electric vehicles and the amount of time to charge them as well. So that the industry is pushing along at a rate of knots, and I think we'd need to watch this space. But but the point is made about the current situation with the current batteries, uh, and I think we need to find an alternate use for them. Uh, my understanding is once they deplete and, and are only 80% efficient, then they're no longer used as car batteries. They're no longer suitable, but there's still an 80% storage capacity there that could be utilised. Uh, in terms of the viability of bringing every home back uh, up to a, a standard that we are building, for example, with our Homes as Power Stations model, you're absolutely right uh, in terms of financial viability. It is costly uh, and it is a huge expense and it, it won't be achieved without some sort of loan or grant subst subsidy from government, uh, I think it's fair to say. I, I don't think that your average homeowner is going to be able to afford, for example, an additional £30,000 to improve their home, knowing that they might not recover that if, if they put it for resale. So there has to be some sort of financial support to encourage homeowners to bring their properties up to a standard. And I know that this is an area that Welsh Government are very much focused on uh, and are looking at as part of their decarbonisation strategy. And I assume there's more to follow on that. In terms of the staff inclusion, I have to disagree. Um, I don't think it's a negative thing that we've had a high response from, from our staff uh, in terms of the consultation. Actually, I think that's hugely positive because 
uh, as an authority and, and, and we, we need to utilise the asset of our workforce to help spread the message of tackling climate change. Uh, and to have such a positive response from the workforce is, is just very much welcomed because at the end of the day, they live um, and work uh, and socialise in our, in our city and our county. Uh, and their opinion is just as much valued as a member of the public because they are members of the public as well as working for us. Uh, and so I, I see that as a positive and we'll continue to try and improve on those engagement methods as we go forward. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, Louise, uh, who's been heavily involved in, in this, will want to comment on that further. And no doubt, Martin, Susie and, and Rachel. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Chair, because I could see Louise and Martin have um, indicated. Um, but that that's uh, my sort of um, input, as it were. Thank you, Andrea. Louise, did you want to add or Martin? Yeah, I think um, Andrew basically stole my point there. I was just, I was going to make the same point that um, obviously our staff do are Swansea citizens themselves. They've got families, neighbours, friends, you know, who and if they're engaged with the process and are willing to make changes in their working lives and their personal lives, then that's you know obviously a very positive thing and and to be encouraged. And and as Councillor Lewis says, yeah, we, we've been very clear from the start that the engagement is 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 ongoing. Is you know this this survey is not the 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 end of the process it's um it's the start of the process and i think it's going to be um really good to, to explore more engagement opportunities going forward as martin said in the presentation especially with our schools and our young people when we're able to do you know face to face or online when, when think the pressure is sort of lifted a bit and and really important that that you know we all do our bit as councillors in terms of helping reach those hard to, harder to reach communities in our own wards and making sure everybody you know knows what we're doing and what more we could be doing and what more they could be doing as individuals so so yeah definitely support what what uh, councillor lewis just said on that thank you martin did you want to add anything on this just a couple of points of ma chair yeah i want to repeat what's been said um just on the on the battery side of it uh, you, you know i think one thing that um the government's direction about you know uh banning the the sale of of petrol and diesel vehicles uh will will do and is doing is driving that innovation in terms of battery technology and that is crucial and, and we as a council for example are having direct dialogue with potential investors who are looking at setting up such renewable battery facilities so so i think that that is a uh, you know a, a moving landscape as as is the case with many of these items um you know it, the status quo isn't something that i, I would uh, is sustainable and i certainly agree with councillor fitzgerald on that but the market has to move to keep up with the the requirements on the new housing there there, there is a role for the council and i think it is leading by example um but there's absolutely a role for both Welsh and UK government you know, around funding this. That, that this is not going to be, um, you know, a uh, a free option. There will be a cost to bringing homes up to these standards. That cost will be significant, both retrofit in existing homes and for new build. Uh, the, the question would be, I guess, could you afford not to do that, given the impact of climate change, if we don't collectively make those decisions? Um, I know Welsh Government are currently reviewing their building regulations at the moment and further improving the insulation standards of new homes, and that is the very minimum they need to be doing. Uh, but I think it is around what incentives can be offered. You know, how do you um, apply perhaps grants to properties, but then have a have, have a charge against the property if it's ever sold, so homeowners don't actually have to lay out the money themselves. There are lots of ways that it could be done. The other thing which I know a number of people are looking at is. Um, by uh, allowing people more disposable income because you're reducing their energy bills, then effectively that impacts on your ability in terms of, you know, your your mortgage borrowing rates. Now that that just shifts the problem to our home owners, which which you know is possibly part of a solution, but not totally. So, I think it's safe to say, Councillor, that there is no definitive answer on that. I think being cited on it being a challenge and a cost gives us a chance to try and influence. The government agenda on it um and finally just just a point on the um the staff y yes you, you everybody's right isn't it of course we would like high participation from all staff and all members of the public the staff response was particularly good but we were selling two things you we were trying to get across the message of the council strategy to the council 
and therefore it's not surprising a lot of the responses were from staff because it directly affects them. Um, would I want more responses from members of the public? Absolutely. As a first stab, it was really good. And that's where the wider engagement plan really needs to hone in on now to make sure that we get that wider understanding of the impact, because a lot of these measures that we need to take will impact on the citizens of Swansea and, and they need to know and they need to be on board with it. So I agree with that completely. As, as uh, Councillor Gibbard has said, we need that is part of our longer term engagement strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Wendy, did you want to come back on any of those? Chair, no, I'll let uh, someone else answer uh, or ask some questions because it's been a very comprehensive reply. Thank okay, you. Well, there certainly was a comprehensive response from uh, uh, the three respondents concerned. I mean, I could go on, but I won't. Well, that's quite remarkable for you, Wendy. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> very grateful. <laughs> I would simply add, incidentally, in relation to the, the size of the uh, response to the, the survey, uh, yes, it is remarkable. Um, and very pleasing the, the nature of the responses. But there's always a slight worry with responses that the people who respond are the ones who are most interested in the particular in issue. So I suspect that many of those who responded did respond because climate change is something they've been thinking about and engaging with and therefore responding positively to the, the, the council's proposed actions. But that sort aside, it's a very remarkable response. And um, those who were responsible for designing and uh, carrying out the, the, the survey really deserve congratulations. OK, I've next got Mary, Mary Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Martin, for a very informative um, presentation. Um, when Councillor Lewis and yourself both mentioned uh, about the journey we've been on, it made me go back a few years. Uh, sitting in either the PSB or LSB, whatever name it was under, looking at priorities for us to take forward as a joint issue. And strangely enough, as you can tell, carbon uh, reduction came up. And at that time, it was hardly ever spoken about. And when I look now to see the amount of work and uh, the progress we've made and the understanding, you know, in what, uh, 11 years, it's absolutely phenomenal because we were doing it with the Environment Centre and they were really, really pushing it. But nobody actually knew what it meant to go on that journey. So I think as a council, we were perhaps more enlightened than we actually realised. And yes, I think uh, we deserve to give ourselves a pat on the back occasionally. I know we don't always get them. Um, I've got a couple of uh, queries, really. Um, it's things that um, have come up in your responses. The first one was about um, the transport and people will leave their cars um, as long as there's an alternative. And you used um, one of the questions, I think, was or um, comment about people, if they were going to meetings, it wouldn't be feasible to go on public transport. But then I thought, well, what happens in London? Because everybody goes in on a train every day. They go on the underground every day or call a taxi or a bus or whatever. The problem we have, which is a more difficult problem, is our local transport and working with them. Because we all know buses finish very early in the evening in some areas. I mean, I'm very lucky. I've got buses outside my door quite frequently. But we go down to where Louise is, which is just, what, five minutes down the road. And it isn't. So it's so patchy, it's not going to be an easy one to crack. I know you said about the, the metro, but that's not going to um, address the issues of the outlying areas like Maul. I mean, as you said years ago, we had a phenomenal bus service. And unfortunately, now we don't. But it's not in the council's gift. Uh, we can only encourage. Uh, the other point was about the electric cars. Now. I applaud the council. I know you're putting in uh, more and more points everywhere. But my son bought an electric car very recently and then realised that not all points fit all cars or you've got to have um, a, a, like a contract with a particular supplier to use that um, electricity. And that is another, I think, problem that we're going to have to overcome is the... Um, ability, like now, I mean, we've lost a lot of our um, petrol stations, but they are still, uh, you know, 
quite widely available. And there are pockets, especially along the M4, as it happens, where there is not the availability, even in the service stations. So it's something that we've got to look at if we're encouraging people to go all electric at this time. I think it is definitely something for the future. And the last one, and this was on the radio this week, which might have been yesterday, about gas boilers. And you're not supposed to have a combi boiler anymore. But I'm not certain if anybody's um, telling the public what they can actually have installed and sort of how much they're going to have to pay for it and any major works they're going to have to have done to their houses if they're going to have these boilers. And, you know, do they have to have new rail uh, radiators, piping, you know, all those kind of issues people are not aware of. And that came up actually in the, um, the phone-in programme it was uh, yesterday or the day before. So, Perhaps I can have a little bit of enlightenment, but overall, I think we're doing a, a really, really good job, and I'm still on the journey with everybody else. Thank you, Mary. Who wants to answer? Uh, Martin, do you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'll pick up the first and the last one, and then I'll leave Councillor Lewis, the, the EV car expert, answer the second one, if that's okay. Um, on the, um, I think, yeah, the, the point around public transport, you're absolutely right. We, you know, I guess London is a different set up clearly from from Swansea and the surrounding areas. Um, I was thinking of examples such as home care uh, and domiciliary care, for example, where you know, an individual might see several clients in a day in a re relatively large geographical area, and, and it would be, in my view, impractical for them to be able to get public transport between each of those clients. Um, it, it, you know, so, so However, if you take other examples, some, for example, housing repairs, something I know a bit more about, housing repairs, many years ago, we would have operated on those local depots where all the trade operatives would have all been based in a local depot serving one geographical area, and they walked between jobs. Now, slightly extreme, but, but the reality is I think there won't be a one-size-fits-all here. I, I absolutely agree that the regional metro system will address perhaps a lot of that inward and outward travel between the main destinations so of people travelling into Swansea City Centre or Clenetli or Carmarthen or Neath Patalbert, um, we will need to look at the local solution as to how then that connects with what is needed within our communities. Uh, certainly, I think there, there is likely to be a change in legislation in terms of bus, bus provision and bus companies, um, you know, certainly from, um, uh, from Welsh Government in terms of looking at the regulations around that. We know there are a number of councils who are potentially looking at public sector owned bus companies again as a potential solution. So, you know, but they, they also have a cost to them. So you're absolutely right. That's one of the challenges we haven't got a solution to yet. And it's probably one of the more difficult one because it's it's much more out of our control than, than within our control. On the gas boiler one, I think that's one of the examples where, you know, a, a clear statement, a bit like the EV um, uh, and diesel and petrol cars was made, you know, we will ban the sale of new gas boilers from 2025 or whatever date they pick. Now, what that's immediately done is force the industry who currently survive on selling gas boilers to then develop the solutions. And there are a combination of solutions coming up in terms of hydrogen and other opportunities and also these sort of what they call hybrid solutions where you retain your existing boiler, but you attach a new air source heat pump to it. So you still have your boiler running your system when it's needed. Uh, but actually what you do is you supplement that with a renewable source because there would not be, it's certainly not practical to rip every single boiler that's currently in existence out and replace them. But over a period of time, if you stop selling new ones, and over a period of time, there will be none of the old ones left. So there's going to be a transitional period there. Um, and decarbonising the grid, which we've been meeting with Wills and West Utilities, is a key aspect of that. Because if you decarbonise the fuel going into the grid, then it isn't, uh, you know, raw gas that's, that's being used predominantly. So, again, that's one that we are mindful of. Uh, and in, in our housing discussions, we are looking at uh, our new developments effectively being enabled to deal with this future technology and also looking at it as part of our retrofit programme as well. Okay, thank you. Andrea, did you want to come in on electric vehicles? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and it is, um, you know, it's a valid observation. You know, there isn't uh, a universal charge point 
across all manufacturers. That Tesla comes to example uh, comes to mind. They've got a bespoke charging pillar which only Tesla vehicles can use, um, and so that is largely driven by the manufacturing motor manufacturing uh, you know um, sector as opposed to us uh, as a local authority, but. Um, the, in, in reality, the majority of electric vehicles have the same uh, charging connection. And so we've gone with the majority of uh, charging connections so that we can hit as many of the vehicles as we can in the industry um, for our infrastructure in Swansea. Um, we also have, um, I know that there's uh, UK government grants to have a pillar if you're fortunate enough to have a driveway to have um, a, a charging post on your property, um, which can combat many of those different uh, charging points. Um, but you're right, the, the Welsh Government are responsible for the M4 and the trunk roads. And I think what we'll see when we move away from petrol and diesel in our fueling stations, we're likely to see EV charge points and hydrogen fueling stations in the future as um, we end up with the abolition of petrol and diesel vehicles in the end. So th there's going to be a, a move towards that. And I know that Swansea University in particular have been looking at that um, as a pilot project, potentially on, on Fabian Way, where you've got that sort of hybrid um, EV uh, hy hydrogen fueling station. So it's something that we're aware of. But I think just to point out as well that most of your um, car showrooms uh, and in Swansea, they generally have uh, EV charging points for their vehicles on their showrooms. So if, if anybody was really stuck uh, and found it difficult, they could go to their local showroom and charge there. But the thing which worries me the most is there's an inconsistency across the board in terms of charging. So Tesla's, you know, Tesla's uh, um, charging points are free. Um, and that is across Europe. Uh, I'm not sure what that looks like for us now coming coming out of Brexit. Um, but we find then that other charging pillars are rechargeable. But um, one thing which I think the committee may be interested in is when we went for the contract um, in, in terms of procurement of our EV infrastructure in Swansea, the supply for electricity is 100% renewable. Mm. The um, availability is 24 hours a day, and so is the helpline, and it's bilingual as well. So we've we've made sure that, and, and we're also supporting a local company. So, you know, we've made sure that we've tried to tick as many boxes as we could in terms of our charging infrastructure. And I'm really pleased with um, the company that we've chosen uh, and the installation, and we're trying to do everything we can to keep costs to a minimum. So, you know, what we really need to be doing is making sure that infrastructure is in place to encourage as many members of the public as possible to take up EV. Uh, and I think we'll see a surge in that, as we're already seeing uh, most uh, car manufacturers at the moment uh, on the four courts. Uh, when I went, it's possibly two years ago, I could count on one hand the amount of companies which had EV or even hybrids. Uh, uh, available. I think you'll see that changing very rapidly over the next year or so uh, as they start to convert their fleets and in turn they give more more choice to the public. And I think it was on the news this morning about the cost of electric vehicles recognised as being extremely high. There are subsidies, but I don't think that they go far enough. And I think that is, again, something that could be an incentive to the public to take up EV. Thank you, Andrew. Mary, did you want to come back on that at all? Uh, no, need to say it's not a Tesla. <laughs> he would love a Tesla, but he hasn't got one. And I think the point was well made about the price of the electric cars, because we were looking to change the car recently, and we were looking at the electric cars. And bear in mind, they need something reasonably high off the ground to get in and out of. And they were, as you said, a, a ridiculous price compared to an, an ordinary model. So, yes, I think that has to uh, be addressed but thank you all for you know the responses which covered all my points thank you rachel i see you've got your hand up is it in connection with this discussion oh disappeared okay 
Uh, well, the next person on my list. Oh. Sorry, I had my mute on. Am I okay to talk? Can I talk, please? Yes, no, sorry. Yeah, yes. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add there was a learning piece really to the technology um, discussion, uh, and just to inform the group that we are working with Gawa College on training our internal operatives, you know, our plumbers and our electricians, etc. <laughs> on how to install new technology. So there's a really good um, training exercise going on there. And we're also working with housing officers on developing operating manuals to um, inform tenants on how to use the new technology as well. So that, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it goes full circle there from installation to actually using. And likewise, um, with a more general um, training piece. We've won some consultancy with APSI recently to work on a home working toolkit to try and help our, all, all our officers to become greener and cleaner mm -hmm. at home. So again, back to the sort of scenario of um, using our pool of um, officers to spread the word. If we can get them on board with behaviour changes, um, then they can, you know, extend that out to their families and it sort of builds some momentum. So there's, there's some good um, educational pieces going on as well. OK, thank you for that. I mean, clearly in relation both to the issue of boilers and uh, electric cars, it's a matter of time and progress that gradually we shall move from the present position to something hopefully more sustainable in climate change terms. And thank you everyone for your advance answers on this. Linda, I think I've got you next. Sorry to keep you waiting. No, that's all right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Right. Yes, yes. I think this is very impressive. Uh, we've been talking about the big picture here. And um, I think that it's uh, it's very informative and it, there is momentum because I was called yesterday to have a meeting with Tyvian in, in Klein Gardens. Now I'm bringing from the big picture to the small picture. I had an hour with him and he is as passionate as Councillor Peter Jones about all this sort of climate change and everything. And he um, he wanted me to, to pass on, I mean, I he didn't know that I was coming to this meeting today about trees. He is concerned that the trees that are being planted, is there a program? And it, he's, I know there is a program in um, Mayo's Road for, for watering, but he said it's important that these trees, you know, have a, a contract to water the trees that are planted. So he's passionate about that. He wanted me to pass that on. But the other thing is that he's passionate about is targeting engagement with children. And I think this is part of the plan as well. His ambition that we were, we sat in, in the park discussing all the things that he thinks that he that could be done in, in Klein to improve people's perception of uh, natural life. But he his ambition is for every school in Swansea, not just the schools in this part of Swansea, but in the other part of Swansea, he wants every child, every every school to bring a class of children to Klein once a year, because let me quote if I can see um, he wants to um, introduce them to the invisible to so that they can interpret the natural world in a personal way, because he thinks that it's if people are involved with knowing um, what's going on uh, in the wildlife, in the parks, then it will sort of filter through to the families and people will be more protective of uh, society and not be so keen on throwing rubbish down and this sort of thing. Now, we had a huge, a huge conversation. He's got ideas of interpretation boards uh, for the school children. Uh, he can, you know, he's so knowledgeable, he can take them on tours of wildlife and mushrooms and his final plea i won't go on any further because i haven't collated everything that he's told me yet his final plea is would he be able to speak to jennifer rayner who is the education person because he feels that he could work with her um on how children could come to the park and because it's a park of of na national importance and uh, and and introduce the children He's, he's passionate about this, so I've done my bit. I've passed it on to you. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Linda. I would certainly concur with the views about the importance of the natural world in relation to 
our climate change policy approach. Um, there clearly is a, an important linkage there, and we mustn't forget that. Andrea, did you want to respond on that? Yes, please. Um, I, I, I'll defer to Martin on the tree strategy, um, but if I can just come in very briefly in terms of um, the engagement with young people and children. Uh, I know it's been um, you know, referred to this morning in terms of uh, the, the overall strategy, but I can't stre stress enough uh, how important that is on our agenda because it's, it's their future and it's they, they are, you know, the legacy that they are going to inherit. And, and so the actions of this council today will affect those generations of tomorrow. And so we are more than keen to involve schools, involve children. And I'm sure we'd be more than happy to extend the invitation which has been given, um, obviously via education. Uh, and we will pass that on, Linda. Um, it's very well received. But I think it is important that we do educate children as to the importance of the environment. But I would like to point out, I think um, it would be surprising how educated some of our young people already are uh, when you visit schools. And um, I declare an interest as a, a director of um, Swansea Community Energy and Enterprise Scheme. But um, pre-lockdown, we held a competition with a number of schools for um, an eco plan uh, and, and they could win a pot of money so that they, as long as it was connected to climate change, they could uh, win a pot of money. And so I was I had the pleasure of attending two of the schools which um, were awarded with the top prizes. And it was in incredibly positive. Uh, and the children were educating me about what the solar panels were doing on their school roofs. They were that well informed and, and that engaged and interested. So there's clearly an appetite, you know, in terms of our young people with this agenda. We need to harness that and we need to make sure that they're heavily involved in our decision making process going forward. And the intention will be to do just that, to make sure that schools are engaged and young people have a voice. Um, so thank you for that. We'll pass that invitation on to, this, to the education department. Thank you, Andrew. Martin, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, yeah just on the... the Three questions. I, I will double check the specific scheme you're referring to, Councillor, but um, the, the general approach for any trees that are planted as part of a project is the, the original contractor has the obligation to maintain them and water them for the first 12 months until they're fully established. I, I will double check. I know that's the case on the other projects, but I'm happy to check on that one. Um, and I think, look, this, this, this will be something, no doubt, you'll want to have visibility of when the tree policy comes forward because it's part of that um, that, that sort of fit for purpose species development that we need to uh, pick up. Um, the other point I was going to make is that um, it, it is in the early days and we have asked as part of the original survey that we referred to for any person who responded to that as to whether they wanted to participate in an ongoing dialogue. So we're looking to build up that critical mass of green champions within the council, but also within the community. Um, so we'd be happy to sort of make the linkages in with anybody who works for us or doesn't work for us who wants to get actively engaged because they are the people doing the jobs on the ground and they can sell it better than, better than I can because they are passionate about their individual element of work. Um, the other thing which our colleagues have, have recently done is, is around the carbon literacy work. Um, so there's a couple of projects being done and both Louise and, and Andrea uh, were part of the first cohort of 20 uh, and um, you know there were 18 other attendees there for, from across the council and they by default have now set up their own network to discuss and look at opportunities going forward and um, we're meeting the trade unions in June to try and explore with the trade unions how we can roll that out to every single council employee particularly those who do not have access to an online uh, method of learning and a computer. So we're looking at that being done on toolbox talks, et cetera, for frontline staff, on all access to the same opportunity. But also they have a direct link to these sorts of ideas. They have a way of easily raising it uh, and then being part of that organisational discussion. So it is early days, but it's really encouraging that there are people out there who really want to get actively involved in this. OK, thank you. Is that OK, Linda? You're happy with that uh, response? OK, thank you very much. OK, uh, very patient Bridget. Bridget Rowlands. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, welcome. 
most of the you know the report then and and all the work that Swansea Council are doing and, and I think it's it's very good what is happening. Um, all that concerns me is um, or, or something I think that we should incorporate into the plan is the tree planting that um, that we have um, undergo you know ongoing work and and planned work and it's the maintenance of the the land underneath the trees. Um, recently, we've had a really, really dry spell of weather, and um, and up with me, obviously, you know, there's there's great expanses of common land, um, and which has gone very, very dry and has burnt severely um, because of arson attacks. Um, and all my concern is, is if we do plant these trees. Um, and we don't manage the land underneath them and vegetation grows. I don't know whether we could incorporate a plan of maintenance into that plan that I think you were going to keep a map of um, of where they're being planted. I just think it would be a very good idea to have a maintenance plan included in it. That's a very interesting comment. Martin, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that separating out the two areas. So, so our current cre sorry, the, the plan for our tree policy is for council owned land, and therefore, yes, you're absolutely right. That would have a need to have the requirement maintenance obligations for the trees themselves to make sure they maintain healthy, but also for the land uh, around that as well. Uh, slightly more more difficult proposition, I guess, where we're talking about private sector land and common land, etc as to because what this would rely on is uh, individual landowners or commoners um, effectively taking the responsibility for um, maintaining. Now, it, it, I guess it depends on, you know, eligibility if they were to apply for and be successful for any sort of woodland creation schemes or whatever. Quite, quite clearly, that would be a direct contract between the landowner and <clears> then <throat> Welsh Government or uh, whoever providing that grant. So that's a bit more of a challenge, but happy to look at the options on that council and see how we can uh, make that work. Um, coincidentally, when we raised this, uh, it was a slightly shorter presentation, I think, at the PSB, um, we've had further follow-up conversation, including with uh, colleagues from the fire service. I actually met with them yesterday and they've shared their plans around how, we can, how they can work with the council to prevent grass fires and how we can look at building in some of our green infrastructure and fire breaks, et cetera, so that, you know, not just on our own council owned land, but on common land, both in terms of Maur and in terms of Kilvey Hill and other areas as well. So so that dialogue is happening with the fire service. Uh, I'd be more than happy to share the detail of that as we move that forward over the next uh, couple of months. Thank you. Wendy, did you want to come in on this particular conversation? Or was it for some other matter? No, it was really on the tree situation. Oh. I, I'm, I've listened with great interest because, uh, you know, trees are something I'm quite passionate about, as you well know. Um, I've been along the Kingsway, driven along the Kingsway a couple of times of late, and I'm just concerned that there seems to be quite a few trees that are dead there. So I'm wondering, you know, we're talking about the policies, the need to look after the trees that have been um, newly planted. How are things um, managed on the King's Way? Because the trees there, some are looking fantastic, but quite a few seem to be on the verge of dying. So I, I you know, if, there's a, if there are any answers, I would be interested in hearing them. Anyone able to respond on that? Martin? Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, coincidentally, I, I walked the Kingsway earlier this week and I noticed exactly the same thing, Councillor, which is a bit of a concern. Um, the, the, that, that is covered by the contractual obligation of the original contractor. So they have the responsibility for maintaining them and they have the responsibility for replacing them if they die. Now, now ideally, we'd rather they didn't die in the first place. Um, so we do need to take that up with them. The species that have been used were selected specifically for that type of project, so they they should have shouldn't have the problems that they've had. Uh, we are doing a current review of of the number of trees and which ones have problems, and then the contractor will be replacing those in due course. But um, what we prefer to is not have them dying on us in the first place. So we do need to look at part of the strategy going forward where we are doing these contracts. It is a little bit of a dilemma that there, there is a benefit of the council taking responsibility immediately for them because we probably would treat them with, how do I say, a little bit more care and attention than, than yeah. maybe contractors would. 
However, then we take the financial liability if there was a disease tree or a, a tree that wasn't planted correctly in the first place. So we're we're having that uh, debate. Uh, if I recall, I think we're taking the responsibility on the the new public park built alongside the arena uh, in maintaining that from day one. So that will hopefully prevent that uh, situation occurring in that location. Thank you. Certainly, Ray, uh, the Kingsway. Uh, my son has purchased a flat recently uh, in the Kingsway. And I seem to recall from a year or so ago, uh, a suggestion that property owners or business owners should take responsibility for looking after uh, particular trees outside their properties. Uh, it sounded a bit unlikely that it would work. Um, and uh, I just wonder whether that is an expectation. It doesn't sound as it is. Um, I don't think my I can't see my son going out with his wolf clan uh, to look after the trees outside his flat. But anyway, does anybody else want to comment on this, or should I go to otherwise Mary Sherwood? Mary, you've been waiting very patiently as well. Thanks, Chair. Um, first, I need to declare an interest because of my employment with Gower Powell, which is something I normally do just in case it comes up in meetings. Um, but that seemed to get a bit tiresome, so I didn't. And of course, this is the meeting where Martin says the council is in the market for a green gas supplier. So I have to say, um, yeah, Gower Power does currently have an, a 100% green energy supply off the line at the moment, so I need to declare that. Um, there has been some mention about fuel poverty. So I think Martin said it was likely that uh, households on lower incomes were struggling in the current situation. I want to say it's not only likely, it's well it's well known. So um, there's an expression called the poverty premium, which people might be interested in. This is the additional money that households on lower incomes pay for essential goods and services over and above what households on average incomes pay. And the last time it was calculated, it was over a thousand pounds a year. Just to have the same level of essential basic goods and services, it costs that much more. And that is because of exactly as Martin said, having a prepayment meter makes your tariff more expensive. You literally pay more per kilowatt hour. Um, transport was mentioned, you know, obviously Mary started that discussion. I would say, um, yeah, transport poverty is a really difficult thing. Fuel poverty, we have a measure. If the household is spending more than 10% of their income on fuel, they're said to be in fuel poverty. But what if they're spending nothing on fuel? Right, they don't come up in the stats as being in fuel poverty and they're freezing. So this isn't an adequate measure. Transport poverty, we don't even have any measure. It's just a qualitative question. Do you do you manage to get where you need to go and how much are you spending to manage to do that? But we know that buses are vitally, vitally important, um, both in the fight against climate change and in the fight against poverty. And I am concerned that the metro plans aren't going to support anyone from our really deprived communities to access opportunities to improve their livelihoods by connecting them better with the city centre or other uh, accommodations. So I, I welcome what Martin has said about, about the bus situation. And even before any um, regulatory changes that might free councils up to be more creative with buses, there are things that could be done with community transport, supporting voluntary transport schemes, third sector transport schemes, which might help with our carbon reduction, as well as help connect people on low incomes to opportunities. Um, so I'm, I believe that there's meant to be a, a joint PDC workshop looking at exactly that. Um, and it would be useful, I guess, for them to be reminded that the environment comes into play here. But what I'm really thinking, what I'm really realising from all of this is how much poverty comes into play with everything that we've been discussing and whether the, um, the climate change strategy could benefit from a bit of a, a kind of poverty proofing look or maybe the poverty reduction PDC could go take a thorough look through that and highlight some of the areas where people on lower incomes are more likely to miss out or more likely to struggle or more likely to kind of um, I don't want to say that I don't have to, to let down our results. You know what I mean, if we don't bring people on low incomes with us along the way, we're not going to achieve the targets that we're aiming for. And, and apart from anything else, overall, climate crisis is a crisis of social justice, where the people least responsible for the problem are themselves paying the greatest price in terms of, you know, air pollution impacts on their health and 
all kinds of uh, other assessments. So that was something that I wanted to uh, flag up and suggest. Um, also, being an Uplands um, representative, I, do, I keep getting queries from people who live in terraced houses who really want to be able to get electric vehicles and street charging isn't really the option that they're looking for. They're looking for a way to have a cable running from their home to their roadside to be able to charge their car. And people are willing to pay. They're asking me, can you get a quote? What would it cost for highways to come and dig a little channel through the pavement so that I can run a cable that won't be a trip hazard to anybody and charge my vehicle? And nobody really knows what the answer to this is, you know. So um, in the survey, when people are saying they want information, I think really this is the kind of nuts and bolts information that people want. Um, I think it would be absolutely brilliant to have a really easy web page with all kinds of links to nuts and bolts, FAQs. You know, if you're a householder in Swansea wanting to live a greener life, what are the questions that you have? And then the council can work on uploading some answers that are easy for people to locate. That was just a, an idea. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, thank you very much, Mayor. You've raised some fundamental and important points there, particularly in relation to families on low incomes. Um, it's perhaps not too, uh, it sounds slightly political for me to say, but often the, the whole issue of climate change associated biodiversity, the green agenda, tends to be inverted commas, more of a middle class policy area of concern than is perhaps the case for people on lower incomes. Um, but, but obviously people on lower incomes are impacted and their ability to contribute to the climate change agenda depends very much on appropriate measures being available to them. Who wants to come in? We've got Martin and Andrea. Which wants to go? Who wants to go first? Martin, all right. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, 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 just in terms of, yeah, very much welcome the uh, the offer to, to attend the PDC. I think that would be a good a good way that you've explained it in terms of you know poverty proof in the the actions. Um, so we we look to set a date up and, and come along and have that conversation and pick up a number of the issues that uh, that you've raised. Um, one of the things I, I didn't mention in the presentation, um, uh, Susie is developing the uh, the FAQs that you've suggested. You've probably raised a few more today. They may not be in there, but the idea is is to have that uh, access to those standardized responses appreciate again you've got to rely on people finding it on the on the council website so we may need to do a bit more to make sure we get those messages out but yeah ab absolutely um on the i'll leave andrew come in on the ev side and then I'll, I'll, I'll we may have to sort of come back to you on the on street charging as well andrea thank you thank you chair and i, I know that um councillor sherwood has, has written to me many many times on behalf of her constituents in, in terms of the the struggle um, you know, the, the frustration that residents have because they want to be able to charge their vehicle at home. And I, I completely empathise and understand that um, because obviously I'm trying to really push this agenda. Uh, and the more people that take up electric vehicles, the better. The, I, I don't want to seem as though I'm intentionally putting obstacles in the way. But the difficulty with terrace properties is there's no guarantee that a resident can park outside their property. So even if we were to channel a cable to a vehicle, there's no guarantee when they come home from their shift or come home from work that that space will be available for them to charge said vehicle. So as I referred to earlier with the advancements of technology, what will happen, we hope, is that uh, people will only really be required to charge their vehicle once a week, possibly once a fortnight. And if, in my mind, if they can do that and charge their vehicle within 40 minutes when they do their weekly shop at their local supermarket, I think that is probably one of the most convenient ways that we can overcome this hurdle. But I do know, um, and I, I believe it's being communicated to the Uplands councillors and Councillor Sherwood, we, we are putting on street charging in the Uplands shopping district, which should go some way to help, but I appreciate it's not the solution. Uh, and I'm sure Martin will come in to say, if we start digging up the pavements, then we could probably be interfering with underground utilities. And it's a, it's a minefield, uh, really, when we start 
digging up the tarmac and putting cables through uh, and trip hazards and, and all of that. Um, it's very, very complicated, very difficult. But I hope as advancements are made that it's going to be a quick 20 minute, 40 minute charge, possibly once a fortnight, hopefully at your local shop or local supermarket, encouraging shopping local and reducing the carbon footprint as well. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll get around this uh, barrier uh, using technology advancements as we go. But I'm very grateful for Councillor Sherwood and her interest. And I know that she's been representing her constituents uh, and we've been communicating on this for several years, I think, Mary. So I'm very grateful for the question. Oh, and, and just if I could just briefly say, I know Martin's touched upon it. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the whole issue of tackling fuel poverty um, is a critical one uh, and is very intrinsically linked to the climate change strategy. And I think this is why Welsh Government are very much focused on social housing in particular, decarbonising and reaching a high energy standards to help tackle fuel poverty as well as address climate change. Of course, we are very keen to be involved in that process as a, a major, uh, as the largest council landlord out of the 22 local authorities, um, but of course it comes with a price. And so we are speaking with Welsh Government to try and make sure that uh, if, if we do uh, have that ability to go down that route, that we can resource it because it's hugely costly and expensive. And the other thing that we need to do is to try and align it with other works in this area that we know are happening in terms of advancements, for example, of the, the national grid, and the, the gas grid. So we you know we need to understand what that network looks like so that we can plan accordingly uh, and put the you know renewables and the energy efficiency mechanisms in place to align with that, that upgrade of the network as well. But it's a very valid point. Um, and I'm sure Martin will want to come in uh, and discuss that further, but I think the invitation is well received to the PDC and I thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Martin, did you want to come back at all on this? No, I think I think we've covered what we can today, but we'll make contact with Councillor Sherwood and arrange to get that PD session uh, diarised. Thank you. It would be Councillor Downing now. He's going to be the next chair of that PDC. So, yeah, okay. I'll include it in my handover. <laughs> thank you both. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. I can't see any hands on the uh, list now. Does that mean that... Does anybody else want to raise anything in relation to... Uh, the net zero car, Swansea report that we've been discussing. Um, well, one person I would ask, Deb Hill. Deb, uh, from your nature perspective, is there anything you want to add or are you happy with uh, things in general? No, it all sounds very positive. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done and, you know, we're trying to, uh, at the moment, you know, do some mapping to identify suitable sites for, for new tree planting. In response to the initiatives that are coming forward from national forest and the queen's canopy etc so yeah no it all sounds uh, you know obviously biodiversity is a key part of um tackling climate change in terms of um green infrastructure and protecting peatlands and salt marshes and planting woodlands so we're very much kind of linked in i think to with martin and the team to help deliver that okay thank you and it's good just to remind ourselves of course about the linkage between uh, biodiversity loss and climate change, they are related uh, and the one contribute, they interrelate in the sense they contribute to each other and we mustn't lose sight of the biodiversity catas catastrophe as we face up to the uh, looming climate change catastrophe. OK, I think this has been a very good discussion, very informative. I'm grateful to Martin, to Andrea uh, and to everyone who's contributed to this uh, discussion this morning. I think it's been extremely helpful, very useful. Um, I mean, we are as a scrutiny committee, of course, charged with overseeing and monitoring uh, the council. And I think certainly from my perspective, uh, I'm very impressed and very encouraged uh, both by what is being done, what is proposed to be done and by the commitment and knowledge of the people who are doing it. Um, so I think we can be very happy, I think, as a, as a scrutiny committee uh, at what the council is doing and how it's proceeding on this incredibly fundamental and important issue uh, that faces us all as we go forward. So thank you to everybody once again for this discussion. I'm losing my voice, I think. 
<laughs> I speak too much. Um, OK, I think that concludes the discussion under the car, uh, uh, item six of the agenda. And then moving on quickly, uh, item seven, which is concerned with uh, letters, um, correspondence with Councillor Hopkins, um, which I think was largely repeating what was in the minutes and really nothing to add to that unless anybody has anything they want to say. No. And then the, the work plan, uh, which is the other item on the agenda, if I can find my copy of it. Um, ah, where is it? Ah, here we are. Um, the work work plan setting out our uh, actions going forward. The next meeting, which is on Tuesday the 29th of June, will be looking at air quality, and that of course is again uh, linked in with climate change in many ways and indeed within the nature story as well. Um, and then later on we'll be looking at flood risk management and the rest and then water pollution. So there's quite an agenda there going forward. Um, I want to discuss with uh, Emily after this meeting, uh, quite apart from uh, just a, a review of the discussion, but I want to mention to Emily whether we should be looking at the Council's use of plastics and the Council's use of peat in its various activities to see uh, whether what the extent of it is and whether there are ways that we might be able to uh, reduce those uses going forward. Peat looks like a good story. Plastic, I suspect, is a more difficult one, um, but clearly something that we need to address. Are there any other thoughts or comments on the on the work plan, agenda item eight, please? Or are we content? Silence I take as contentment. Um, it's nearly well, coming towards midday. Thank you, everybody. I think we've had an extremely good meeting, an extremely useful meeting. I'm certainly very pleased with it, and I hope everyone else is. I'm sure there'll be positive follows up, follow ups from it. Um, and uh, I declare the meeting over, and thank you all very much, and goodbye. Thank you.